Greetings and welcome to Old Drunken Discography, where old friends and fans come together to BS, argue, occasionally agree, and discuss a musical artist. With me today is the illustrious Tim. Hello. And our special guest, Heimster. Hello. <laughs> nice to be here. Man, <laughs> you say that, but like, I've been listening to The Who for a week, and I was talking to Tim the other day, and I was like, I'm going to use me monies. I was like, damn it, I've been listening to The Who too much. The horrible Who. <laughs> so, a nice rock and roll band from Shepherd's Bush. We're here to talk about a little album called Tommy. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know much. I've never heard about this record. Mm. You ever heard this one? Uh, you know, I did get to see the off Broadway version back in the nineties. Okay. Um, and yeah, um, I, I, I have the album cover sleeve, but no, I've never heard it. <laughs> I, I used to have that. I swear my dad had that one, but I'm going to have to repurchase this one. Whatever. Yeah, no, obviously, uh, obviously I've heard it. Um, seen the movie did, I got to see the play. Um, I mean, so the last album we were talking about concepts and how Pete's formulating a concept in his head that involves uh, a spiritual ascension. It also involves rock and roll and pop art and society as a whole. And a big step in that concept is the concept of a child who has suffered some abuse and uh, has his senses um, taken from him. Right. Tommy, Tommy seen some things. <laughs> Tom, Tom, Tommy did see some things. Um, on the album, it's obscured. In the movie, it's implied that uh, Uncle Ernie kills the dad because he's in love with uh, with Tommy's mom. I don't know. It's it's I, still I, kind of obscured can, there too. I but. can give you the synopsis um, as it was published uh, following the release of the album. British Army Captain Walker goes missing during an expedition, is believed to be dead. His wife, Mrs. Walker, gives birth to their son. Years later, Captain Walker returns home and discovers that his wife has found a new lover. The captain kills the lover in front of Tommy. Tommy's parents coerce Tommy into believing he did not see or hear anything. Hence, you didn't hear it, you didn't see it, you, didn't, you never heard it, not a word of it. Tommy begins to dissociate and becomes deaf, dumb, and blind to the outside world. Tommy now relies on his sense of touch and imagination, developing an inner psyche. And there's more. Okay. So, so uh, uh, one interesting parallel to real life um, that I wanted to bring up on this episode is uh, Pink Floyd's The Wall. Mm. Roger Waters never knew his dad. Because he went off to the war and never came back. Hmm. Um, Interesting. So in many ways, you could say Roger Waters is Tommy. Yeah. Another thing I want to point out is that synopsis that you just read, that's only tracks one through what? Through, through, through Amazing Journey, basically. Yeah. yeah. Like, that's just that. Correct. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Because then, of course, Tommy becomes a spiritual leader and causes a revolt. Right. By the end. Yeah. Then so there's and, the Uncle Ernie stuff and the cousin and the. Yeah. Yeah. Ed Whistle yeah. talks about um, not understanding Tommy at all. He said, um, um, "He said I didn't. I never understood Tommy until I saw Ken Russell's film." And then he pauses and he says, "And he was wrong." Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's an ant whistle humor right there. I love right. it. Right. Um, so, yeah, uh, it, it's a double album. It, it's a lengthy piece of music. It is musically connected. It is um, 
it's broken into tracks, but you can take it as one giant piece. Right. There are individual tracks here that definitely stand out on their own. And, you know, you could throw them on any greatest hits album and not think of anything of it. There are others here that are very essential to the story, but on their own wouldn't really do anything for you, I think. That's um, my issue. Um, but the, but to be fair, yeah. some of those songs, like the one in particular, like Tommy, can you hear me? It's just a, a it's just one little phrase, but it will get stuck in your head. Oh, it's an earworm. Yes, yeah. indeed. Yeah. Um, there musically, you begin to see something that will follow Townsend through his entire career, which is the um, the sustained chord. Uh, you have mm-hmm. the sustained chord of the overture, the opening notes, which are the exact same opening notes as Athena. It's the exact same opening note as Can't Explain, right? He does mm-hmm. this thing. It's there's, there's a certain drama to the way he's opening up the piece. It's this dun, 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 dun. And in the case of Tommy, it's dun, dun. Done in Athena, da da dun, da da dun, da da dun. This is something that he does consistently. Whether I mean, I, I and he's conscious of it, and and this is this is a thing that he does. You see it in in um, in both Overture, um, and in um, Twenty One as well. He does the same opening sustained chords. You've got sustained chords and who's next as well. So something to look for, you fans out there, you guys who are just learning about the who, you'll see this as a late motif in a sense of Townsend's sure. work, right? Mm-hmm. No, there's definitely a thread, and I'm gonna get even further into the weeds on it on the next album we talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, there's definitely uh, Pete Townsend definitely has a writing style. And he knows what works. And I think he knows, I think he has an idea of what people want to hear. And I think he's part of his internal frustrations is uh, marriaging those two things. What he wants to do and what he thinks the public wants from him. Or as, as he's put it, he said, I keep rewriting that song. I can't explain because it was the first hit. And it mm-hmm. turned him into the spokesman for the band, right? Mm-hmm. So, in a sense, he's still coming back to that formula, wanting to write the hit again, and he's also trying to do something different and deep and and, and a narrative in nature or whatever it is. So there's the, the there's the internal conflict that we see inside of his work, right? Even the the appearance of Pinball Wizard in Tommy is a is exemplary of that. He didn't even, and, and when he presented the album to his buddy, to the musical writer Nick Cohn, for to get an initial uh, review for the New York Times, Nick Cohn said, "Well, I'll give you a good review of it if you include a song about pinball, right?" So he wrote that song as you know, as a as a, uh, a sops to a fan, right? And then it and it obviously it becomes practically the biggest hit of the album um unwittingly uh almost what about their career or even absolutely oh, yeah definitely it's either this or baba yeah well yeah, yeah i mean there, there's definitely some arguments to be made for a few songs but yeah uh obviously pinball wizard is in that conversation yeah i mean my dinner you, you could argue they never beat my generation as far as iconicism, you know? Yeah, that's right. True. That's true. And and capturing the zeitgeist of the time, right? Right, and, like, yeah. Speaking in the voice of the team, right? Mm-hmm. What's oh, really, for sure. What's really interesting about Tommy is this was a year before the Kinks Lola. Hmm. Sure. Sure. That's really interesting. I never, never uh, considered that. Yeah, I think I think the Tommy influence hit early, hit young, and mm. still to this day, this mm. is a highly well. Yeah, culture. and I mean you could feel its influence all the way into the 21st century. Um, there would not be a Green Day's American Idiot without this album. 
uh, both musically, conceptually, spiritually. Right. Um, Night at the Opera, Queen. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Was this before Night at <laughs> the Opera, too? Oh, sure. Holy crap. Yeah, we're still in the 60s here. Yeah, this is 69. Jesus Christ. You know? Right. <laughs> that was a no, they single, they single-handedly did something revolutionary with Tommy. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and it was their last ditch effort, too. They were going to, Townsend was ready to mm-hmm. hang it up. They were bankrupt. Like they were, they were struggling. bankrupt. And this, this not only took them out of bankruptcy, it made them millionaires. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, it got him a Tony award eventually. eventually. Like, uh, th- this, this album is the gift that keeps on giving. Oh, very much so. Very much so. The, you know, the, I, I saw the, um, the production, the the off Broadway production of this, I think you mentioned it too, Tim. Mm-hmm. Um, here at the um, either at the Mark Taper Forum or at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion in Los Angeles, and I was like sobbing. I mean, it was just it was such a, a incredible experience being in the audience with you know everyone's a Who fan in the audience, and if they're not, they're becoming <laughs> one at that moment. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I don't know if in your particular production that you saw uh, during Overture, um, it's this plane on the stage and the propellers are twirling right there in front of the audience. And, um, you know, as the it's like the sound of the pinball, da dun, da dun. And each time it's you hear that, it's another um, paratrooper dropping out of the plane. It was masterful. It was yeah, absolutely, it was. It was. Uh, it was as if the as if Des Mackinough and 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 Townsend heard it the way a fan hears it, and and brought it to life on stage. It was magnificent. And now it's pa- it's back on on Broadway. I would love to t- fly over to New York and see it again. Just incredible. It's an inc- it is an incredibly spiritual album. Mm-hmm. It really is. It gives me a zap every single time I listen to it. And what does it for me is the refrain, you know, the uh, listening to you. Oh, sure. Um, it's such a moving piece of the puzzle. Yes. Um, I almost want every band to just throw that into their concert. Right. Just in the middle of your own song. Just start playing Tommy. Like right. things will go so much better. I um, think it was it was during Tommy that Townsend cites that at a certain point in the concert, everybody stood up. The entire audience stood up mm-hmm. and never and and basically remained standing through the entire show. Um, and listening to you um, uh, personifies that that it's yeah. it, and it, it's it's the message that Tommy is giving back to the audience that it isn't about me it isn't about this false messiah it's about each and every one of you right 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 it's, and it's, it's about really, that connection that you get yeah. at a live show where Correct. everybody's feeling the same magic that's right that's right yeah and uh it's uh, you know the who is the greatest fucking rock band in the world <laughs> at, at that moment at that moment Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, some individual songs I think should be, uh, mentioned specifically, you know, they work on their own, obviously amazing journey. Um, I think Christmas is awesome. I think, uh, the acid queen is awesome. Pinball wizard of course works on its own. Um, I really love I'm free. I really love, uh, a sensation. Like there's just a whole bunch of just beautiful songs yeah. uh, on this album. I'm free was a single. Yeah. B side of we're not going to take it. They sort of clipped that out of there because a 45 only gives you so much space. Right. So put on you know. Yeah. Uh, some of my highlights would be like Sally Simpson. Oh yeah. Um, that's a top song contender. Uh, it's got like a slightly southern gospel feel to it in parts That's interesting. Yeah. yeah 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 um go to the mirror is a top song 
Jesus, I'm reading my notes. Top song, Go the Mirror, Feel About. I love this one musically. Feel About. Uh, it's a dark Ant Whistle entry it's into so this. Dark. That, uh, that, that, you know, Ant Whistle just knows how to write a song. That, that's he does. When, that's he, does. When, uh, he has this sardonic approach mm-hmm. to songwriting. Both in, both I, I think it was Rolling things. Stone magazine said that Ant Whistle had the misfortune of being a really good songwriter in a band with a great songwriter. Yeah, that's really yeah, interesting. 100%. Yeah. 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 You know, when he died, I remember the day after he died, um, there was a, a tribute piece on NPR. Um, and I think about it and I still get choked up. They just started playing the opening uh, verses to uh, Cousin Kevin. Um, and I, I sat there, you know, listening to this piece on the stereo on the news and I just sobbed. I just broke down because at that moment, it's like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Yeah. It was, We're on our own, cousin. It, it just hit me. It, it just hit such me. A lost. Dark lost. song. Yeah. It is a dark song. There's some dark themes here. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I hate to say the who did it first, but did anybody go this dark before this? Like, like actual child abuse on a record? No. Uh, yeah, I don't think so. This was the lyri- the lyrical content. That's what makes Tommy so great is, yeah, it's just, it, it has an overarching theme, but there's a lot of little themes and little like social commentary and things going on on each individual song that yeah. mm-hmm. just makes pro- it... prostitution and drug use and all of these things happening mm-hmm. on child yeah. abuse uh bullying bullying False right messiahs right That's tommy's right. uncle turned into uh jack kelly from it's always sunny in philadelphia <laughs> um, you know the the uh, the uh, the book uh, by Richard Barnes, um, Maximum R and B: The Story of the Who. I have that um, book. Has, That's great. Yeah, there's a great there's a great uh, headline. It's you know, hailed as a bunch hailed as geniuses when we were really a bunch of scumbags. That kind of checks out. <laughs> uh, and then yeah, Ken Russell made a film. Um, with Eric Clapton, Tina Turner, uh, Elton John does Pinball Wizard, Jack, uh, Nicholson. Jack Nicholson, and uh, and you get Anne Margaret rolling around in baked beans. It's <laughs> worth it just for that. Mud or chocolate or whatever the hell it was. Whatever it was. <laughs> That's all you need. Um, yeah, no, it's a, it's a fantastic movie that um, helps explain the story, but it also, you know, keeps it just as muddy as the album yeah. um, so you're left to your own interpretations you know the, thematically some of the stuff that's happening in tommy um rears its head again in the most recent album sure and um in a, um what's the, the 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 there are two tracks on there that are um quasi thematic um which is um hero ground zero which uh, really sort of is a, 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 a verbal um, uh, description of, of Daltrey's appearance in Tommy. Um, and um, the other one is um, Beads on One String. Anyway, we'll get there. Yeah, Eventually. we'll get there. <laughs> I don't think Jason's made it that far yet. No, but... I ain't got there yet. Yeah. <laughs> what, what's you know, interesting uh, about like, like, like Sparks... The, yeah. mu- the music, the way they play their instruments is very, like, sharp and jagged, and you feel, like, you don't have to be on drugs to feel the message behind what they were trying to do with this record. It's a very, very yeah. I don't want to say And if you've seen the, uh, the fantastic film Almost Famous. I was just going to re- reference that. Yeah. There's uh, the point where they give uh, the kid the records, and he That's begins right. his rock and roll journey, and... Uh, you know, the song they use in that moment um, is Sparks. Yes. You see the album spinning. You see the, yeah. the label twirling on the on the spindle. What is it? Listen to Tommy with the candle on and you'll see your entire future. And, you know, speaking of which, um, that 
you don't need drugs to enjoy this. I mean, it's it's always great to enjoy the album with drugs. I'm not enforcing that, of course. <laughs> well, in the well, there's your album. opener right there. You're always have on medicine. But, but in honestly, it, in, in all honesty, the album produces, it induces a drug-like experience. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. 100 percent you get you, the acid when you get to the acid queen the music fits what tommy is going through at the time it's enduring yes yeah um the the another you know i i love referencing back to various interviews of of townsend and his you know the the birth of the concept um was um he took a um a tab of piece of um pcp it's something like 20 times more powerful than acid on a plane flight and he said he you know he had it was he was a frothing mess and he had an out of body experience um but something that he came to understand was that there is this whole other realm um, which we are all deaf, dumb, and blind to. Um, and um, th it was that, in addition to his introduction to the spiritual guru, Mayor Baba, who was, he was introduced to, to Mayor Baba by Mike McInnery, the guy who did the cover for Tommy. Um, and, and so that, influence also finds its way um continuously into townsend's career in tommy and throughout after tommy as well yeah. we're going to talk about that a lot more on the next album as well it it is it it's a it's a watershed album in so many ways now that's going to lead us into uh the subsequent tour of this right. album which included a little stop in woodstock new york Yes. Um, there is also um, a fantastic performance from the Isle of Wight, 1970, um, which uh, there is film of. We talked about it earlier about uh, as far as the best documented live version of this band. And if you can find the live of Isle of Wight, 1970, I would recommend watching that film. Mm -hmm. uh, it is um it's the infamous skeleton suit that Entwistle wears throughout the whole thing right. that flea right. um you know copied a couple times um and then uh it's also um pete townsend's attire throughout this time period was right. a white bowler suit, suit. Nice. um and i'm gonna point out that a clockwork orange came out in 1971. oh interesting so yeah. yeah, so are they all just trying to be Pete Townsend? In that really movie? Interesting. I don't know. <laughs> uh, nice. You know, food for thought. Right. Um, but then another stop they did in 1970 um, happened to be on February 14th in a town called Leeds. Right. Um, uh, some, interesting, some fun facts about uh, Live at Leeds. I, I guess we're ready to go to that. I don't know. What a segue, Tim. What a segue. I'm trying. I'm trying. Nice, nice work. Um, so yeah, February 14th, 1970. Um, some fun facts is that's also the same day that the Allman Brothers recorded live at Fillmore East. Mm. Oh, wow. Right. Um, and uh, February 13th, the day before this album was recorded, was the day the first Black Sabbath album came out. Um, so I'm not going to dispute that Black Sabbath invented heavy metal. But I am going to point out that the day after their first album comes out, the Who give you one of the heaviest recorded documents of music ever put on tape. Yeah. The only thing I gotta Are, say that I gotta say about Live at Leeds is, if you're an aspiring bass player, <laughs> go listen to Live at Leeds, My Generation, and then think about your life. And if you really want to be a player. <laughs> um, and uh, kind of keeping it with the theme of the video here. So, yeah, the original album, of course, you've only got so much time on a, a piece of vinyl. 
Um, the remastered CD edition expanded it to include all the songs that they played that weren't Tommy. Right. And then the deluxe edition is a two disc version that includes the entire concert and it includes the entire performance of Tommy. Yes. And if you've got two hours of your life that you want to uh, experience one of the best rock and roll moments in the history of rock and roll, um, listen to arguably the best concert ever recorded. Yeah. No, it That's is a fair recommended. That's a fair it statement. is. It was, uh, was it? Cited as the best live recording of all time by the Daily Telegraph, the Independent, the BBC, Q Magazine, Rolling Stone. And I think the only two that uh, give it any sort of competition are Deep Purple's Made in Japan and Eric Clapton's MTV Unplugged. Interesting. The cover was meant to look like a, a bootleg. It was, mm -hmm. it was modeled after uh, a Rolling Stones um, live album that came out a year before um and the liner notes were just a gift you know all of this photos and um either rejection from you know their con contractual rejection from one of the labels and this is just great stuff on the inside it was a treat um and what else about leads um you know a, another interesting fact um is that they they had hours and hours of of live material and they needed to deliver something to the label because the label was pushing them for something to follow up tommy uh to keep their name in the public view as if it needed that right <laughs> um, and and so um bobby pridden uh who's their sound engineer presented Townsend with hours and hours of, of tapes. And he said, you know what? I don't have the time and I don't have the patience to listen to all of this and go through it and find the best stuff. Um, so it was just uh, left to Pridden to compile the album and Townsend had the rest of it burned well that that's clearly um i don't know what the word is that that's um i think that's damage control at the time because there is a super deluxe edition of this now yes where they hull. have the entire shows of the entire week so they have the hull shows and they have this but mm -hmm. even in, in the hull show there's a lot of bass missing so they actually lift oh, some of the gosh. bass track off of this to fill out what was missing um, interesting okay so um but Townsend has been he has been quoted as saying that the decision to burn the other material was the worst decision he's ever made interesting okay I'm, okay i'm gonna have to agree because i'm sure that there were just gems in there that were certainly lost i didn't know that that they uh lifted some of this for hull that's interesting yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Leonard Bernstein grabbed Townsend by the shoulders after a live performance of Tommy, and he said, "Do you know what you've done?" <laughs> you know, it was this. It was a moment across the music industry um, of not just uh, something that was um, exciting. As, as a recorded piece, as a studio piece, but that they were able to translate onto the stage with such incredible power, mm -hmm. you know? And as you listen to the extended version of Leeds with all of Tom, particularly, you know, Amazing Journey, the, the drum work, <laughs> Amazing Journey is just, it's like, you know, I, I, I said it earlier, um, it's like this organized tripping over yourself it's just amazing it's it's like syncopated incredibleness that's my that's my one note for amazing journey is keith does some great drumming <laughs> like he carries the, the whole show they're all just on fire yeah this is probably the the peak of the who live that's right is this, totally this early 70s in between tommy and 
Oh, probably Quadrophenia is when it probably starts to drop off live. That's interesting. Oh, that, yeah, well, they had all those problems with the tapes on stage. With right, right, well, and then and then that's also when Keith starts getting reined in because he's having to play the tapes and click tracks and all that. Yeah, stuff. but yeah, the, uh, this period right after Tommy is just pure unbridled fury on stage that no. uh, you can just feel. Even though these these more recent re-releases and the super deluxe and all of that stuff is great, the original release, the tracks that we're looking at right here, you know, that is my relationship with Live at Leeds. Sure. As, as a kid, you know, just the, the power of those tracks, one after the other, as a single oh, yeah. vinyl is a remarkable thing and i don't get sick of it even magic i mean magic that version of young like... man blues is incredible yes. that version oh, of summertime blues is incredible yes yes that cover magic of shaking all amazing. over magic bus is incredible yeah the, the, the guitar work the the jazzy guitar work the 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 um the um what's it called um the harmonic uh, guitar work is just, you know, transcendent in Magic Bus. Amazing stuff. Aerosmith put out a <laughs> live record that kind of copied this too. The live is that right? Big, that they went for the whole like it looks like a like uh -huh. a boot unofficial leg. bootleg thing. The who did it first? Yeah. <laughs> no, <it's funny. laughs> Yeah, as great as Tommy is on its own, um, the live versions of it just bring it to life even that oh, much more. The live it's versions are it is a, it's like this interpretation. It's like a further interpretation of the studio album, which you didn't think was possible. Yeah. Until you hear it, it's like, wow, holy mackerel. I don't need the horns. Look at that, you know? <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Now, this is where it's going to get <laughs> interesting. <laughs> yeah, I've been debating this one uh, for a couple days. All right, what about you, Heister? Where are you putting it? <laughs> <laughs> is it better no, than... You, I, I, don't, I don't want to um, violate you know, sort of the, the, the canon on this. I think, you know, it's, it's sort of largely agreed in a lot of ways that Tommy is, is at the top of the heap. Um, but, you know, Quadrophenia is, is, is a, is a more um, accomplished and unified piece of music in a lot of ways. Um, and there's who's next to deal with. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. Um, let's see. How does your ranking work? Can we leave? Can we leave blank spaces here? We're allowed to do that. No. So you want? You're just ranking it against the three that are on the screen the right now. That we've got. So don't even worry about Quadrophenia yet. Cheapers creepers. Yeah. You you deal with that bridge when you get to it. All right. <laughs> um. Sorry, I'm... Is it better than my generation? Well... <laughs> the hard questions here. There, there are... There, there's obviously a very good argument to say that it was. And yet, um, all of these things act, you know, in progression of one to the next. You wouldn't have one without the other. That's true, too. Um, so it's it's a tough one it's a tough one um in my experience you know tommy like I've, i i i mentioned earlier changed my relationship to to pop music um because people that i respected told me to listen to it you know in that same way that the same thing happens in um in that uh cameron crow flick um yeah you know you have to listen to this album right um 
All right, let's 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 do something daring. Let's say that Tommy comes um, in between um, sellout and um, what is that? A quick one. A quick or one. Yeah. Jack. Why not? Why oh, not? Oh, let's so. have some fun. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's a bold move, and I I respect it. <laughs> I respect it for sure. Because that, that's I'll um, have a cashew nut to that one, huh? <laughs> uh, I'm going the same way. I, I I think I respect Tommy. It's it is what it is. It's it's epic. It's its own piece of history i mean it wasn't done before this that's right but i would rather listen to the who sell out i mm. think mm. well put because well it's put. a a it's shorter it's a different kind of concept it works in right. a, it, it works in a different way and it's more my mm. there's a lot of tommy that i could take it or leave it Mm. Not in the context of the story, but from a li just a listening experience, I got more out of the sellout. Mm. Okay. So that leaves you, Tim. Yeah. Um, I think we're going to be unanimous here. Really? Um, ultimately, I think Tommy is probably a better album. But I like who sell out more. Holy crap! <laughs> I was expecting it to be a hot take, but I guess the three of us are. Hot well, takes. it might be a hot take, it but it's they are. They're both pretty damn close to perfect. Well, we get legions of comments down below, like you guys are fucking dumbasses. <laughs> we'll know. That's fine. Neither of them are in the red. That's for sure. That's fine. Oh yeah, none of them are red. Well, um, none, none of these are red. There's a great, there's a great live Tommy performance from France, and it's a bootleg I picked up in college, and I've lost it ever since. Um, but their version of um, Tommy, can you hear me? The harmonies are just fantastic because you really, it really emphasizes Ent Whistle. And his falsetto. Um, and, and That's the always album, a treat. In the album, it's very Daltrey centric. It's ooh, Tommy, Tommy. And in this live version, you really hear Ed Whistle going, ooh, Tommy, Tommy. And there's something about it. It's as if it's as if he has this understanding of what the way the song is supposed to sound. Um, which I've never heard in any other live recording. I wish I could find it. I'm sure it's out there. One, one other, uh, I didn't mention the closing track, but holy crap, that is a closing track. It sums up everything. It references yeah. everything. Keith Moon does like some crazy slow like drum rolls that are just, it's a phenomenal record. It is. It is. <laughs> it's a phenomenal album. Yeah, we're not taking away from it here. So, up next is... Who's next? Who's next? <laughs> we'll see where that one stacks up. Maybe that'll be a hot take. I don't know. So far, we're lining up pretty good, so we'll see. If you like the Who, check out the playlist link down below, and it'll just play all of them in one big shebang so yeah get caught up figure out why we like who sell out more than tommy <laughs> leave us a comment down below let us know your rankings and be safe make good decisions that depth on the fly, kid. Sure plays a mean, mean.